for this big bush on top of my head. Come in, Francesca. I just have a visitor coming through the house, so. Animal or mineral or human? <laughs> Sister. Oh, okay. One of four sisters. Fun. Paul, your, your shirt kind of matches your rug now, too. You know, I picked it out on my own. Usually I have somebody else pick my clothes out because I don't see the colors. Hey, in the old Hi. Day. Hello. Hi, Estelle. Hi, Estelle. Um, Hi, you guys. So uh, when you said if somebody will take your clothes out because you yeah. don't see colors, okay. Yeah. Yeah, my partner, um, she, she loves ties. So she picks the tie, shirt, jacket, you know. <laughs> so is that hereditary right. colorblind this fall? Oh, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, some people say it comes from your mother, but my father certainly was color deficient, blind, I don't know, deficient, uh, I guess. Deficient. You know, yeah. um, my brothers all, all men, all my brothers have an issue with colors. What wow. colors? Specifically what colors? I'm curious. Well, you know, the base color is red, green. And, uh -huh. what, and what happens is, I'm not sure which one is stronger on me, but if I look at something like purple and navy blue, really can't tell. And uh, um, and I think it's the red component, you know, because green and brown, I have the same. I can't see those either very well. I was at the eye doctor this morning, and they gave me a a color blindness test, which. I think wasn't the old sort of wife's tale was that it was only men. Yeah, the women. theory. Yeah, well, the theory well, it's, is it's about twenty percent men and less than five women. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, they showed one thing, and I could not get the number out of it, and I thought maybe yeah. I was colorblind. But he said only colorblind could pe people could see a number in there, and I went, "Yay!" <laughs> really? What, yeah. what was it? Were they square pictures or round? Round. You know, the round one, I believe, is the ancient one that I always took. And then somewhere in the 70s, they came out with like a rounded TV screen kind of, you know, uh -huh. rounded corners, small rectangle, rounded corners. And because um, I used to practice memorizing them so I could. Okay, see. guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ready? I love the chat, and this is okay. the beauty of this is the beauty of Zoom. Everybody gets to look in on us as we check in with each other, and that's beautiful. Um, thank you so much. But I'm looking at the clock here, and we're actually a little past four, so I'm gonna do my duty and remind us that you are now joining uh, the uh, Humboldt County Association of Governments meeting of uh, September 17th in accordance with executive order N29-20, the uh, HCOG meetings will be held virtually until further notice. So uh, when HCOG board announces an agenda item that you wish to comment on, uh, call the conference line and turn off your TV or live stream. Please call 669-900-6833 uh, enter the meeting ID 846-1827-5132 and press star nine. And this will raise your hand. You will continue to hear the meeting while you're on the call. But when it's time for public comment on the item and you wish to speak, we will unmute your phone. You'll hear a prompt that will indicate that your phone has been unmuted. And I believe at this point with the new Zoom protocols, you may have to press star six at that point to speak. So if you don't get on there, just uh, press star six. So thank you very much, everybody. We're now calling the meeting to order and uh, we'll begin with a roll call. And I believe it's Christy is going to do that, please. Mayor Winkler. Here. Mayor Jones. Present. Mayor Seaman. Here. Council Member Smith. Here. Council Member Johnson. Here. Council Member Strong. 
Here. Council Member West. Here. Supervisor Fennell. Here. Council Member Patino. Here. Kevin Tucker. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. We have a full um, board. That's great. Um, now we're going to adjourn as the HCOG board and convene as the Policy Advisory Committee. The PAC convenes to include representation from Caltrans and the Humboldt Transit Authority, HTA, for items that are specific to transportation. Um, at this time, we're going to open it up to public participation. This item is reserved for matters that are not on the agenda uh, that may be presented to the public over which the PAC has jurisdiction uh, at some point in the future. Uh, right now, as I look at my uh, list of attendees, I only see participants. I don't know if we have anybody from the public wishing to speak. Um, uh, if there is someone in for the public, could you please uh, go through that process to uh, give us public comment? Do you see anything, Christy? Uh, no, I do not. Okay. I think we've given it enough time and we will um, now go to approval of the meeting record of August 20th. And um, I hope everybody's had a look at that. And do I have any comments on that item or any corrections or anything like that? I move we pass the minutes of the August meeting as delivered. Thank okay. you, Mayor Jim. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Patino. Um, any discussion? Any public comment? I will say that for the record, but I can state with a fair degree of uh, accuracy that there's nobody at this point joining us in the, as an attendee. But if you're watching on a computer or if you're watching on TV, you can uh, call that those numbers and press star nine. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission and we'll do a roll call vote again on the um, meeting minutes from August 20th, please. Hey, Mayor Winkler. Aye. Mayor Jones. Yes. Mayor Seaman. Aye. Council Member Smith. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Yes. Council Member Strawn. Yes. Councilmember West? Yes. Supervisor Fennell? Here. Councilmember Patino? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Thank you. Pass unanimously. Thank you very much, Christy. Appreciate that. And that will bring us to item number five on the agenda, which is uh, the consent calendar. We have a uh, one item on there, uh, highway infrastructure program, uh, programming resolution 2020 and resolution 2021. Uh, anybody want to have any discussion about that item? I move that we adopt the consent calendar as submitted. I'll second. Thank you, uh, Council Member Winkler and Mayor Seaman. And um, I will again uh, go out to the public. Um, still no sign of anybody. So I'm going to bring it back to the commission association and then we'll um, take another roll call vote. Christy, we're keeping you busy here. All right. Um, thank you. Mayor Winkler. Aye. Mayor Jones. Yes. Mayor Seaman. Aye. Council Member Smith. Aye. Thank you. Council Member Johnson. Yes. Councilmember Strawn? Yes. 
Council Member West? Yes. Supervisor Fennell? Yes. Council Member Patino? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Thank you. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, so now we're going on to uh, first item um, for action, a PAC action actually. And this relates back to a discussion we had um, at our last meeting, the formation of an ad hoc committee. Um, and this is to look at the p potential for adding additional members. Um, are you going to present this, Marcella, or? Una has the honor. Thank you. Una, welcome. Thank you. Um, so this is a follow up from last month when the ad hoc committee was created and the ad hoc committee um, directive is to help draft targets and performance measures that will then be in the uh, regional transportation plan presented to the board to adopt in 2021. And the members on the ad hoc right now are uh, Mayor Winkler and Council Member Johnson and uh, Mr. Kevin Tucker. And in the interim, I did reach out to Mayor Seaman because she had been absent at the last meeting and I did tell her um, what the board directed and that this would be a chance for um, additional members to volunteer for the ad hoc. And um, the ball's in your court, board. Okay. Thank you so much, Una. And so back to uh, the uh, board and I will go first to Susan, because uh, Mayor Seaman, because you weren't here and everybody else talked about it, but you didn't get a chance. Would you like to be a part of that ad hoc committee? So I did say um, that I do think I I do think I would be interested in being part of it. I asked the question though, is it um, is it gonna affect a Brown Act? Because there are only five of us on this. Well, um, uh, okay, so I think we did have a bit of a discussion at that time. Please re remind me, but I think that I we discussed that there might not be two mem members from Arcata. I don't know. But at the same time, Councilmember Patino is representing the HTA, so I don't know how we go down. The um, and then also, um, Mr. Tucker is part of the the pack, and as is Mr. Patino. So that is um, oh, that's right. Technically, you know, that is a different committee. Um, yeah. But also, you would not have um, half of the quorum just yet. And also, the ad hoc committee has not met yet. They decided. Uh, to wait for for this um, to see if there was going to be another member. And um, there's also the option that every meeting would be noticed and open to the public um, in a formal way. And I have had um, comments from CRTP, as you will remember, they um, submitted a letter with some proposed draft language and they are very interested in participating and that was also a question they had if and when the public would be uh, participating in the ad hoc committee or if it would be waiting for the larger public participation and I can as staff facilitate either either process um, the, my idea is that after the ad hoc or and as the ad hoc works on drafting targets, I will be doing outreach to the public. So the language that does come to the board, um, it may be iterative, iterative. And in any case, you will get um, what I've heard from the public comment when you do deliberate about the draft language. So I guess my my only concern, I mean, the, the whole concept of an ad hoc is to get together with a task, get it completed and off of your plate. Um, the, I'm always concerned about creating more standing committees. Um, is there a way that we could create a committee that had 
uh, a, a specific goal such as an ad hoc committee and then retire it once that task is done. Yes, absolutely. And um, if the board wanted to decide at what point of the draft their, this ad hoc committee's um, job was done, then that would work very nicely. Um, mm -hmm. on, on, and, and we're going to be working on, on this RTP update for over a year. So there'll be chances to have another ad hoc or just review things in a different way. Okay. Well, um, I, I, I just realized that we didn't memorialize the um, uh, Council Member Patino's interest, but uh, let me just ask uh, Mayor Winkler and Council Member Johnson for your thoughts on, on uh, creating something, uh, uh, and Kevin, um, about creating a committee that is uh, a, a standing committee or, or a partially standing committee that is uh, subject to the Brown Act. Well, I think that makes it more complicated as far as having to have formal mm -hmm. minutes and uh, and public notices. So, uh, to me, that would be significantly more work for uh, HCOG staff. So, I would yeah. rather not do that if we can avoid it. I mean, if it's essential. Uh, the the other question is having to do with how large a subcommittee uh, becomes subject to the Brown Act and and and. It, it depends on what body, what uh, sub entity of, of each cog it's meeting under as, as to I think what what um, a quorum would be, would be my understanding. Have we determined what that is in this case? Una? That has not been determined. No, it wasn't included. Um, but um, with Mr. Tucker on it, I think uh, it should be the PAC. Yeah. And, it, and what they were, working what they are working on is just to recommend something to the board so it, that would be logical to me so if possible i would like to include mayor seaman because she's expressed a strong interest in being part of this and uh if if in order to, to do, do that we would have to have a uh, a standing committee i think that would be worthwhile just uh to be able to include mayor seaman in, in this so but what's I, the quorum I, I would rather not do that if we can avoid it but if we need yeah. to then then, then do it to include, so we can include Mayor Seaman. So what's the quorum, quorum of the pack? Sorry, five, five. Yeah. So we have Mayor Seaman, Kevin. It now stands at four members in, if Mayor Seaman is included. So that's not a so that's not oh, a violation. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfectly legal. Uh, let's just do an ad hoc with four. I think that probably meets all meets what we were thinking about. Great. Okay, great. All righty. Okay, doke. Well, um, that being the case, would anybody like to make a motion to memorial? Well, I guess let me uh, open it up for public comment just just in case somebody's out there. Oh, wow! I do have a. Uh, I have a number with a hand up. I don't know if this is a member of the public, but I'm going to welcome you to speak. Welcome. Uh, it's a, the case? Uh, yes, it's a number uh, ending in 5603. Yeah, hi, that's me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, hi, this is Colin Fisk with the Coalition for Responsible Transportation Priorities. Um, I just wanted to comment that, well, I guess, first of all, just um, thank you again for, for setting up this um, ad hoc committee. And I think um, I think it'll really uh, be an important improvement to the RTP to have some um, specific and measurable targets, particularly related to the climate crisis. Um, and, you know, as to the form of the committee, I just wanted to comment that I think an ad hoc committee, um, although not subject to the Brown Act, I don't um, know of any reason why they couldn't, uh, you know, invite participation from stakeholders should they desire to. And, and I would encourage, um, you know, CRTP is obviously interested. I believe 350 Humboldt may also be uh, interested. They've also commented on this issue. So I would encourage them to uh, do that at the appropriate time. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Colin. Um, any other comment from the public? I'm glad I realized that uh, Colin was in the attendees. Um, I don't see any further hands up. Sorry, everybody, I'm squinting here because I'm using a, a small monitor. <laughs> so I've got to move things around. So I, I okay. want to go ahead and, and, and move to appoint uh, Mayor Seaman to the ad, ad, ad hoc uh, committee or subcommittee. Second that. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, I would like to, um, I know that we don't discuss uh, that much a comment, but I would like to offer an, uh, some clarification there with uh, what Colin brought up. Uh, ad hoc committee can meet with as many people as they need to meet with. You know, it's just, um, it allows for a little bit more flexibility and movement. And um, definitely it would be important to meet with people who are voiced their um, interest in doing so. So just want to add that in there. Um, so we have a motion and a second, and we've had public comment. So let's go to Christy for roll call, please. Hey, Mayor Winkler? Aye. Mayor Jones? Yes. Mayor Seaman? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Aye. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Strong? Yes. Councilmember West? Yes. Supervisor Fennell? Yes. Council Member Fettino? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Thank you. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much, uh, Christy. And thank you very much to all four of you for stepping up. And uh, we look forward to the first of your labor. We'll be hearing back from you pretty soon, I hope. Um, so on to item number 7B, which is an update of the regional safe routes to school prioritization tool. And this comes to us from Una as well. Welcome yes. back. Thank you. Um, so HCOG first uh, approved the Safe Routes to School prioritization tool in 2012. It was um, kind of a first of its kind, at least in the rural communities. And it is used to um, learn more about our schools in the whole region and what their uh, readiness is and their interest in doing active transportation projects under the Safe Routes to School program. And um, we have been um, methodically and periodically updating it. So after 2012, uh, two years later, we worked with RCAA and updated the inventories, which means contacting the schools and asking them about information about kids biking and walking to school and parents interested in being champions for such things. And if they'd had events uh, for international walk to school day and those kinds of things um, that show um, a level of interest for then going for grant funding um, if they had designs in mind. So then we did another update in 2016-17. We have not yet been able to update the inventories of all 108 schools, but we are continuing to put this in the OWP so that we can keep um, updating the inventories and mm -hmm. keep this uh, to be a very relevant, useful document. Um, I do want to note that although it's a prioritization tool, it, the priority is not ranking what school is the most needy or most worthwhile. The prioritization is something completely different from that. It is um, 
the competitive competitiveness of a school at that current point in time, um, how likely would they be to score high for very competitive funding? And mostly what we think about is the active transportation program, the statewide one, which is very competitive and always oversubscribed because schools and cities and jurisdictions uh, statewide, of course, all have a need and a desire for that kind of funding. So the 2020 version um, is the first time we've revamped the whole narrative part of it. So I've restructured it because it's not our first one anymore and we have a little bit of a history to share now. So what we have now is a plan that um, is useful for both the people familiar with this kind of program and unfamiliar for those unfamiliar with it. For example, if there's a new principal at a school and she um, wants to do something but doesn't know that her school has ever done anything, she could um, refer to this report and find out what other schools in the area have done, find out what kind of funding is available and maybe get some ideas of what she could do at her school. She'll also find out about the Safe Routes to School Task Force, which actually was created um, after the 2012 project that HCOG um, um, hired RCAA to help us with. And then for people familiar with all of this, this hopefully will be a really good tool for them when they do decide to apply for a, a grant and they can refer to this, the rankings, give some data about every school, and um, there'd be histories about past projects that have gotten funding. And, um, and then, of course, the report has a, uh, quite a few resources that schools and um, public works departments and um, health departments can look to to find out more about um, good practices for safe routes to school and active transportation and what kind of funds are available. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is the update we have before you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Una. And let me just say, I really like the cover page, <laughs> a Charlie Thomas. Um, but um, you know, for for the rest of the board, it's uh, first of all, I just want to reflect that will this go to every school? Will they all have a copy of this? Uh, no, we haven't done that before, um, but we could certainly give CDs to or flash drives even to everyone. It's always up on our website and um, by request we could print um, and bind the reports for by request. Okay, Barry, I'm, I'm just thinking that because a lot of times when people bring an issue to me, I'll say, you know, this might be something for safe routes to school. And and they may not even have been thinking along those lines, whereas if they have it there, it may just go, well, this this could work for us. You know what I mean? Yes. But again, yeah, if you if you can do it by request, that's probably just as good. Yeah. Um, and we're trying to update the inventories every other year, or every three years. So mm -hmm. also that helps us keep in contact. You know, if people don't have a printed one, then then hopefully they come on our website and get the most recent. Yeah, that's true. Okay, good. Um, uh, any questions or comments for Una on the uh, Safe Routes to School Prioritization Guidelines? Just going to say that I think they did an excellent, she did an excellent job in making the narrative and especially in the funding sources because that's always mm -hmm. a question people ask is how are we going to get the money and it yep. explains it and having used the old prioritization tool when I was a part of the TAC and knowing how that went and the usefulness it had this is even going to be better and I also like the picture on the cover yeah. that was our one of our first big safe routes to school projects that uh, happened here in Fortuna. I was looking for you in the picture, but I don't see that cowboy hat, so I don't think you're uh, there. It's, there. it's the black one right above the windshield in the uh, little red car. Oh, there. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do see it now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other comments from uh, the board? 
Uh, yes, Paul. I mean, uh, Council Member Patino. That's fine. I I just uh, noticed for me the best quick reference out of this whole thing was the pri prioritization list. Yeah. And that would be there's a, just a few pages. I mean, that would be something that every school should get a copy of. If they're on the list, they get a copy of the list and they see where they are. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't need to read the whole 70 pages or, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it might interest them into reading how did they get that prioritization. Mm -hmm. But the first thing they're gonna wanna know is where am I on that list? Yeah. And, and I think uh, council members and community activists They'd like to know that first also. And then, you know, they walk around and can decide for themselves how, how accurate is it, you know? So that, that's just a thought of mine. Yeah. Um, through the chair, may I respond? Absolutely, oh, after, after. please, Anna. yeah. Okay. And then we'll take some. Um, yeah, so I love that idea, and um, if this is approved today, I will then work to send out announcements to all the schools, and it would be really nice, you know, to touch back with them, because many of them have gotten calls through the inventory things, and um, I think that would, yeah, it would be a, a nice additional connection to make with them, and then on a slightly different note, I will also be working on um making this more uh, readable for people with uh, vision impairment. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Una. Thank you, Una. Council Member Strawn. Yeah, I would just like to say that we are in the process of ATP uh, Safe Routes to School project right now in town. And um, I would just like to say that there was a disconnect in between safe routes to school, uh, gathering information and uh, coming to the city meetings, showing us the plan, uh, getting the uh, concept, what we were going to do as far as bike lanes, as far as sidewalks, uh, City of Redale has no school bus. Most of our kids walk to school. We have very few who ride bikes, but really the ATP seemed to really lean towards the bicycle side and not so much the sidewalk pedestrian portion. And um, we just had a real breakdown from the meetings we had at city council at the school and then when the actual contract came out, what it looked like was very different from what we talked about. So I just wanted to throw that in. Uh, uh, we're still working on it. We've made changes through the process, but um, it was disappointing. The, in fact, we were even told that safe routes to school was like a thing of the past. You now have to go by the ATP. Uh, guidelines. So it was kind of confusing. And I really felt like we spun our wheels a little in uh, trying to stick to safe routes to school rules. And then it was different when it actually the money came and it came down to rubber meets the road. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Strand. Anybody else have uh, comments or questions for Una? Okay, with that, I'll open it up from, for, for, oops, I don't know what I did here. Um, for comments from the public, I hope I'm still on. You're still on. <laughs> Am I gone? No, you're on. You're, you're fine. Yeah. Um, but I don't okay, see any calls coming. Oh, oh, okay, uh, there. There's uh, no public comment. No public comment. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with that, I'll bring it back to the board and um, welcome any further discussion or a motion. 
I would move to recommend that the HCOG board approve the 2020 update of the HCOG regional state routes to school prioritization tool. I'll second, I'll second that. that. Thank you both. Appreciate that. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, let's go for another roll call vote, please. Okay, Mayor Winkler. Aye. Mayor Jones. Yes. Mayor Seaman. May okay. Aye. Thank you. I didn't realize I was on mute. <laughs> Councilmember Smith. Thank you. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Strong? Yes. Councilmember West? Yes. Supervisor Fennell? Yes. Councilmember Patino? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Thank you. Passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, then. Um, thank you again, Una. And now we go on to yet another item from Una, and this is the HCOG Mobility on Demand Strategic Development Plan final. Thank you. Back. So last time uh, the board saw this, you asked for some changes, and we were also still in the public comment period. Um, so I've worked with the consultant, and the consultant has made the requested changes to the potential pilot projects. And I uh, did a summary of the public engagement, and I put that in an appendices. So that is the com completed uh, final before you today. And we did get some written comments and there are three letters in your staff uh, report that show those written comments. And I will also include those as part of the record in the final. And um, I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Una. Um, any questions or comments on this item? Mm. Seeing none so far. Okay. Let's see, I'll just scroll down here. No, nope, don't see any hands up. Okay. Um, any public comment on this item? I don't have any public comment. Oh, thank you, Debbie. All right, then let's go forward here. And again, this is the mobility on demand. Strategic Development Plan final report, and I will entertain a motion for this action item. I'll move to recommend that the HCOG board adopt the HCOG uh, Mobility On Demand Strategic Development Plan. Second. We got a motion and a second. And we'll go to a roll call vote. Um, Mayor Winkler? Aye. Mayor Jones? Yes. Mayor Seaman? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Councilmember Smith? Aye. Thank you. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Strawn? Yes. Council Member West? Yes. Supervisor Fennell? Yes. Council Member Patino? Yes. Mr. Tucker? Yes. Thank you. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, so now we will uh, reconvene as the HCOG board and the requested action by motion um, is to approve the pack recommendations that we just voted on. I so, will, oh, you're looking for that? I'll move to reconvene as the HCOG board and approve pack recommendations. Yeah, I'll yeah. second it. We've got all sorts of seconds happening there. Thank you. Um, and we'll go for another roll call. Okay, Mayor Winkler. Aye. Mayor Jones. Yes. Mayor Seaman? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Aye. 
I'm sorry, Council Member Smith. Aye. Thank you. Council Member Johnson. Yes. Council Member Strawn. Yes. Council Member West. Yes. Supervisor Fennell. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. And on to item number 8A, and this comes to us from Debbie, our fiscal administrative officer. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you. And uh, this is um, the uh, revised HCOG personnel policies and procedures and CalPERS Public Employees Medical Health Care Act. Perfect. A lot of work to do that. Welcome, Thank Debbie. You. So the item being brought before the board tonight is as Supervisor Fennell said, um, the Public Employees Healthcare Act with CalPERS, it needs to be updated. Um, and also before the board is consideration to revise the personnel policies. In 2000, HCOG entered into an agreement with CalPERS enrolling the employees in the medical um, program for the employees and the retirees. At the time of that adoption, the board chose an unequal method for employees and retirees. And at that time, um, it was with the agreement that the increase would happen on a yearly basis until the retirees and the employees became equal. That is going to happen in January of 2021. Because it is going to become equal, there is a need to update the resolution so that we have an equal contribution resolution agreement with CalPERS. Staff did meet with the board's executive committee and with legal counsel to discuss um, those options that are before us. And the three different options that the executive committee discussed is outlined in your staff report. The first one is to maintain the current benefit level at 100% for both the employee plus one dependent. The second option that they talked about was to adopt an equal contribution resolution with a set contribution for both the employee and the retiree. And if the board chose to do that, you can set that dollar amount at any dollar amount you would like to, as long as it is higher or at or higher than the um, public employee statutory minimum requirement. The third option was for the um, board to adopt the equal contribution at the minimum contribution and with that contribute the amount needed to cover the annual cost of health care for future active employees at 100% and a contribution of 33% towards one dependent. The executive committee did discuss all three options and their recommendation as well as legal counsel and staff was for the board to consider recommendation number three or option number three. If the board does decide to go with that option, there is a need to update the personnel policies as well. And those policies will be updated to include language that was provided by legal counsel and that has been also provided in your um, staff report. So at this time I can turn it back over to the executive committee for them to add anything that they would like to regarding those meetings that we have. Thank you very much Debbie. Um, Mike you want to uh, give a little input on that please? Uh, it's captured very well in the staff report. It was yeah. not a, a lightly taken uh, meeting and yeah. decisions that had to be made because fiscally and health-wise and employment-wise, it covered each one of the areas. And we did, as you can read in the staff report, adopt a, a formula covering the employee and a portion of the employee plus one's health care. And going forward, that is the 
recommendation that the executive committee has and is bringing to the board. This will affect people hired after January 1st, 2021, uh, the new executive director and the new planner position. And it was interesting, I'll say that much. <laughs> uh, it is interesting. A lot because of, we're... go ahead. No, no, go on, John, uh, uh, okay. Mike, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say that it, there is so many different ramifications in there. I mean, legally, fiscally, uh, getting the correct uh, quality employee because that is one of the items that is looked at when uh, you're making a hiring decision, when the employee, future employee is looking to see if they would like to be employed in this organization. So we tried to encompass all of those things and this is what we came to a decision in and bring it to the board. Thank you. And I, I think that um, Council Member Johnson uh, covered it extremely well. We did take it apart bit by bit, looked at each uh, set of combinations and how we might move forward from the system that we have right now. And this just seemed to be in our uh, minds, the one we could afford and it would also be a good, you know, a good situation for the future. And so um, welcome everybody's thoughts on this. And as you said, um, as Debbie pointed out, we do actually have two other options, but um, I think that the executive committee would want to hear some pretty clear arguments for either one of those if we were to move forward. And and very welcome, I'm very, very um, ready to hear those arguments. So, but okay, anybody have any thoughts on, on this uh, this item? Wow. Okay. Um, let me ask you this then. Pretty quiet. So let me just say this. Let me do a little bit of a straw vote on what your feelings are about um, option three. Is, uh, good. Before we go forward, unless, unless there's uh, already everybody likes option three. So let's start. I'm just going to go by my screen. Mayor Jones. Uh, yes, I'm in favor of option three. I feel like an equal contribution from the staff and Hitchcock seems like a, a good halfway point. And uh, it seems that staff is agreeable to this as well as the uh, others that worked on it. So uh, I'm completely in agreement with, with option three. Wonderful. Um, uh, Mayor Winkler. What I'm always concerned about is uh, long-term costs. So I don't know if we had, have had, I don't know if I saw that in the staff report, but among the three options, what would best uh, control long-term costs to, uh, to the organization? I don't know if we've done that analysis. I would be comfortable with option three, but I would like to hear uh, feedback on that if that has been analyzed. Debbie, can you help us with that? I can. So when the um, staff met with the executive committee, we did um, have a table. And unfortunately, I don't have that right in front of me. But option three was the fiscally um, best op option for um, HCOG to take. Right now, HCOG pays 100% of health insurance for the employee and the retiree. And for those vested employees that are already under that agreement, that will stand. And so for future employees, they'll get 100% of their insurance paid and only 33%, which is gonna be a pretty big savings for HCOG for future. And then when those employees retire, they will only receive the PEMCA minimum statutory requirement towards their health insurance. And so in the long term, um, as 
the current employees retire and expire, <laughs> the savings will be, you know, significant to the agency. So in terms of long-term costs, did, did you do a, um, a comparison among the three options as far as long-term costs to the organizations? To the organization, I mean? Yes, we did. Yeah, so you're saying that among the three options, that th option three would best uh, control long-term costs? Well, the other option that they, we, they didn't really consider at all was for there not to be for the agency not to pay any health insurance except for the minimum requirement. But they discussed that a little bit, but decided that in order to um, get good employees that, you know, the agencies should, and because the majority of your cities pay health insurance for their employees that HCOG should continue to go along that same route. Uh, that makes sense because you, you need to be fair and you need to be competitive. That's exactly right. That's what we looked at. Uh, thank you, Mayor Winkler and Mayor Seaman. I always think it's so sad that every year with whichever organization you're with, you have to go through these difficult decisions. Um, I think it's always important to try I think that if the staff is is um, feels like this is a good recommendation, it it's probably the right one. I, I mean, I, I can't find one that would be better. Um, it's just hard when you have to cut from 100% to, you know, share in the cost. It's not the wrong decision. It's just it's a shame that that's the way we're always having to work. Yeah. Yes, it is. But overall, I, I agree. I agree with the decision, and I'm sorry that we had to make it. That's well, it. For clarification, I just want to be open and transparent. It's not going to affect the current employees. Right now, the HCOG employs four employees that will stick with what were vested employees. Okay. And so <laughs> this is going to affect future employees. Yeah. Okay. I know. That's Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Yeah, it was clear. It's okay. just the people who are coming into the workforce now don't have as uh, good a, options as people who have in the past. It changes, it changes year to year, let me tell you. I've seen it myself. And yeah, it gets so. harder from year to year. I mean, they yeah. benefit less and less compared to what they used to be. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's an old person invested. Right. Well, you know, um, we should just be, in, well, I'm going a little too far with my opinion, but I think we should be happy that we actually still have something like this, to tell you the truth. I mean, the way things are going. But anyway, I'm not revealing my card. Um, Council Member Strong. Yeah, I think option three does look best. It is sad that we have to go from a hundred to a third, but um, I'm sure you guys took everything into consideration. Thank you for your hard work. I agree with option three. Thank you. Council member West. After spending many years watching what's happened with education and how that's changed, Actually, I'm very impressed with this. So I think, and I thought three by far was the best when I looked at it. So I appreciate what you've done. And I think three is a good option. Thank you, Council Member, Council Member Smith. I think um, that option three is, um, is the best. Thank you. And Council Member Patino. Oh, actually, you're the. I'm yeah, not sorry. in part of this. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you're, I'm, okay. Um, well, back to uh, Debbie. I just like to do that sometimes when we're making this kind of a decision, just to get a sense, you know, um, we don't just jump on something because the work's been done. Um, and I do appreciate the conversation that we had. 
um, to get to this point and then of course appreciate all the work that the staff's put in. So with that, I would entertain a motion and we have a couple of, uh, of resolutions attached to this. I'll go ahead and uh, move to adopt resolution 2018, revising HCOG's personnel policies and procedures to include tiered healthcare benefits for employees and retirees of January 1st, 2021. And do you want me to do both of them together? Um, we had just had this question at the board the other day and I'm not a, oh no, at LAFCO. Let's just do them one at a time, please. I know it's, it's important. Then I will end there. <laughs> okay. Okay, so with that, uh, we have a motion to adopt. I'll second Thank it. You. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member West. So we have a motion again to adopt uh, resolution 2018 um, and we do a roll call vote. And Christy will do that, please. All right. Mayor Winkler? Aye. Mayor Jones? Yes. Mayor Seaman? Yes. Council Member Smith? Aye. Council Member Johnson? Yes. Council Member Strong? Yes. Council Member West? Yes. Supervisor Fennell? Yes. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Christy. Don't go far. We've got another one for you, I think. And um, I'll, I'll go back to, to Mary Seaman because she actually was thinking of doing both at the same time, so. Okay. I don't want to, don't want to hog the time, but happy to do it. Um, and adopt resolution 2019, fixing the, fixing the employer contribution under the Public Employees Medical Health Care Act, PIM Hitchka, at an equal amount for employees and annuitants and direct staff to establish a health savings or reimbursement account to provide contributions in the name of the employees and the annuitants hired on or before January 1st, 2021, in an amount equal to the difference between H. Cog's PIMICA statutory minimum contribution is approved in resolution 2018. Forgive all of my mispronunciations. <laughs> I'll second that one. Thank you for that. Uh, do we have um, public comment? Public on this? comment on public comment on this item. I there is no public comment. Thank you, thank you, Christy. Okay, let's go again with another roll call vote, please. Okay, Mayor Winkler. Aye. Mayor Jones. Yes. Mayor Seaman. Sorry, I. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, Council Member Smith? Aye. Council Member Johnson? Yes. Council Member Strong? Yes. Council Member West? Yes. Supervisor Fennell? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, and thanks again for going through all of that. It's an important step, fiscally responsible as well. So let's go on to item number nine. That's the HCOG staff and PAC member reports. And it is uh, reserved for matters that members of the PAC and staff may wish to present. I'm gonna start with a Caltrans report on the 101 corridor project. And uh, Kevin, if you would please. Finally, get Certainly. to speak, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the construction is uh, scheduled to begin uh, at the Samoa mitigation site starting next week, September 21st. Design is progressing with uh, the Indianola undercrossing, and the current target design completion date is January 15th that they're working on right now. Jeff Pimentel, the project manager, will be working with HCOG staff and Caltrans programming staff to prepare a CTC book item to credit HCOG the RIP shares 
due to the low bid savings that came uh, from the SOMO mitigation construction contract. Uh, this book item is targeted for the December CTC meeting. Thank you, Kevin. Any questions for Kevin on this item? Okay. Thank you for all your work. Um, any public comment on this item? See any there, Christy? No, there's no public so. comment. Okay, great. Thank you. Not great, but thank you for your help. And um, so that takes us on to another report from Caltrans, and this is on the last chance grade. Back to you, Kevin. Yeah, so last chance grade, the, uh, I've mentioned in the past, the geotechnical drilling that's been taking place. The phase three is on schedule. And that's supposed to start next week. Uh, the project team is engaging with various working groups to screen the different alternatives. That's kind of the next step in the process. And they are, the goal is to narrow down the list of alternatives to three or four, focusing on ones that are most feasible and reasonable. And they're hoping to complete that um, early sometime next year so they can move on to the full list of environmental and engineering studies required for the draft environmental document. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, any questions or comments? Yes, Mayor Seaman. Um, so you're trying to narrow it down to three or four choices in the future. That's the goal was that date that you gave away in the future. Or are you doing that now so that you can have one choice? By... I can't remember well, what the when you're... said. <laughs> yeah, so it's three, narrowing it down to th two, three, or four, mm -hmm. and so that's taking place now. And it's um, with the environmental document phase. You know, you do have to have a certain number of alternatives. So that's you know the three or four meet the meet those guidelines. But in order with a project of this size, you know, you don't want to study things that aren't necessary. So if we can eliminate some sections of routes or some of the alternatives, you know, that, that helps with saving cost and time for the overall project. Okay. Thank you. This is Marcella. At one time, I believe there were seven or eight alternatives with some A's and B's. <laughs> so that's um, right. You have to herd it in uh, somehow. And the public participation aspect of the project has been really um, spectacular. Caltrans District 1 gave a presentation at the California Transportation Commission meeting last year, I mean, excuse me, last month. That was very informative. Um, and I can find that and the timestamp and send that to the board so you can take a look at that as well. Okay, I was just imagining that we, you would go down to a final decision or like a final one. So three or four is, uh, that was just surprising. Okay. Yeah, um, and thank you for bringing that up, Marcella. You've been very quiet today, but um, yeah, that, that um, I think that the way that Caltrans uh, gave people an opportunity to look at all of that and, and to be very active in, in public participation was very, very helpful. And it really, I mean, I think aspects of it were pretty unknown to everybody, even engineers and everything is sort of huge issue so coming to getting down to that point is pretty good so really appreciate it any further comments no okay well thank you very much kevin and um i don't see any public comment either um any other items from staff or members well, I'll just say that um, we did not get our statistics in time for the mailing for the um, Eureka Police Department um, on the corridor, the safety corridor. So we'll report that next week. And then just the other thing I wanna say is that Una, Debbie and Christy are so, such an awesome staff that maybe you don't need me for the next three months. <laughs> they did an excellent, no. nice sitting back. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the way I'm seeing the way I'm seeing this, Marcella, is you're giving a gentle, you know, 
help for the transition yeah, I like it. and I appreciate <laughs> it. I do, I really do. It um and we can see it there. Um but thank you very much. And thank you of course to Debbie and uh Christy and Una for their work uh, taking on all of that. And yours too. I know you're working there so um Again, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, no further comments or input. And we will say we are adjourned. And thank you all for joining us again this evening. Drive okay. safe and be clear. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, everyone.